Hello, it's good to see you again. Welcome to the program. I'm Felicity Ezewike. Still reeling from the effects of COVID-19 and the Ukraine war, African countries, according to a publication by the Institute for Security Studies, face yet another geopolitical huddle with the Red Sea crisis and its potentially significant economic ramifications. While current disruptions will primarily affect trade routes and supply chains between Europe and Asia, African countries won't escape the impact. But smart countries, are said, could derive some commercial and strategic benefits from the turmoil as global shipping companies are diverting valuable cargo around the African continent to avoid Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. But writing for TRT Africa, Umar Abdul Razak, however, cautions that while a handful of African countries may stand to benefit, the majority are poised to bear the brunt of high inflation and environmental degradation. According to him, the current media and political treatment of the crisis ignores the losses incurred by Africa. To look at this crisis and its implications for Africa, I'm joined by Menzi Mblovo, political economist, Cape Town, South Africa. Menzi, it's good to have you on the program. Thanks for giving us your time. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be with you, Felicity, and greetings to your viewers as well. Thank you. Let's start with maybe a brief on the Red Sea and its strategic significance and why this crisis is such a huge concern. Absolutely. So, as you know, the Red Sea is arguably the world's most strategic shipping lane. All right. It accounts for between 12 and 15 percent of global cargo and the bulk of trade between Asia, Africa and Europe. And this includes a variety of things like oil, food and electronics. Now, as a result of the crisis, which has been induced by Houthi attacks on commercial vessels, all of the world's logistical companies, the major ones, have had to divert their shipping from the Red Sea to around the coast of South Africa. Now, this comes at a massive cost, all right? In terms of uh, timing, it adds between 12 to 24 days, all right, of travel around South Africa. And then in terms of costs, it adds around $700,000 of fuel costs alone to shipping journeys. And this is a massive burden. Now, what is worse is that the crisis is, one, not showing any signs of easing, but then on top of that, you have two other key logistical crises. The first one being the Black Sea crisis, and then the second one being the Panama crisis, the brunt of which Africa is feeling. So we might find ourselves in a scenario where we are shuffling towards a COVID-style logistical crisis where global logistics may come to an effective halt, which would be turbulent, not just to the African economy, but the global economy at large. All right, let, let me ask you, this seemed to be an amplification um, of the potential mm. gains for some African countries from this crisis. Mm. I want you to talk us mm. through some of them and why people are talking about it. Yeah, so I think that the discourse on gains is, uh, is somewhat ahead of itself, all right? If we look at the data, um, and it, granted, it's been a short period that this, sh this crisis has been ongoing, but the data is not showing any substantial gains for any particular country. And countries where you would expect some kind of gain are not doing so. Why is that? That is because a lot of those countries don't have the facilities to actually derive benefit from the crisis. So we're talking about countries along the coast of Southern Africa, countries like Mozambique, countries like Namibia, countries like Mauritius, countries like uh, Madagascar. These countries are well set up from a geographical perspective, but from an infrastructural perspective, a human capacity perspective, and a logistical management perspective, these countries aren't well poised. The one country that could potentially benefit if all things were rosy, is South Africa. But as you're well aware, South Africa is going through a logistical crisis of its own. South Africa's key logistical parastatal is under turmoil and is therefore unable to fully maximize the benefits that derive from the, the, the crisis. So yes, 
there is a uptick of ships calling onto the harbor. You can see them here. I'm sitting in Cape Town right now. I can see the sea. And there is a disproportionately higher number of ships that's making a call to harbor. But because of capacity constraints, those benefits aren't accruing to the extent that they could had we been well positioned, all right, from a uh, an infrastructural perspective to capture those gains. I'll say this, though. What is positive is that policymakers are seeing the opportunity. Granted, it may be one crisis too late, but they are starting to see the opportunity. And more importantly, they're starting to see changes in global logistics. We no longer live in the 90s under the umbrella of Pax Americana. Global logistics is shifting, all right? The Ukraine crisis was the first portent. The Panama crisis is another one. And then there also is geopolitical instability in the South, in Southeast Asia. All of that suggests that policymakers have to be alert to changes in geopolitical shifts and then prepare themselves for impending opportunities. And they are doing that. So we are seeing substantial investment by countries such as Mozambique, countries such as Namibia, countries such as Kenya, countries such as Angola, and South Africa is also ambling along. And so perhaps we might not have been in a position to capture the opportunity from this crisis, but the movements are such that we may be better positions for future crises and also to become a more impactful logistical player in the globe. Oh, fair enough. Um, it, it does uh, beg the question, though, that why do we need such crisis to not just in the right direction? But that's another uh, conversation for another day. Mm. However, I would yeah. like you, uh, the way I phrased this question originally was uh, to look at the toll it would have uh, on Africa, this crisis, I mean. Uh, but based off of what yes. you've said, I'd like to rephrase that to be... What is the implication of this crisis for Africa? So you just go with it. Of course, of course, of course. So we jump to the benefits. Let's look at the costs now. And again, there is a bit of a lag in the realization of this toll due to a number of factors. The most important one being the fact that in the past three months, all right, insurance companies have kind of kicked in to cushion these global logistical firms from higher costs, all right? And that prevented the burden shift to consumers. But these insurance buffers are running thin. So if this crisis con continues, shipping companies will have little choice but to shift that burden to consumers. And Africa will find itself in a bit of trouble, right? There are four concerns that may arise. The first one is inflation, which will necessarily occur as shipping companies shift the burden onto consumers or to their purchases, purchases onto consumers through higher market prices, right? The second one is a commodity spike. And this will occur due to the fact that there are constraints in ferrying oil from key Gulf producing countries to global markets, right? And that will have an inflationary concern. The second is a monetary reversal. Now, there's been talk throughout the market of a normalization in interest rates after last year and the 2002 inflationary spike, all right? But if central banks see that there is higher inflation in the horizon, there'll be little incentive to normalize interest rates. And this will have ramifications that are fairly far reaching. Number one, it will make debt more expensive, or it'll retain debt at a higher price, both for consumers and for states. And it's particularly pressing for states because a lot of them were looking at monetary easing in order to tap into international markets to buttress some of their public balances, all right? If this doesn't happen, we might find ourselves with similar fiscal crises as we did in 2023, all right? On the consumer side, all right, you have higher rates, lower credit growth, lower private sector activity, which ultimately suppresses the demand side of the economy. And so that might ultimately reduce our growth potential for this year and uh, reverse the, the rebound that a number of economic agents were talking about. So the potential ramifications from this crisis are, are quite plenty.
and they're quite severe. And dare I say, on an African economy that is still reeling, as you said, that is still reeling from the ramifications of COVID and from the ramifications of the Ukraine crisis and where our fiscal and monetary toolkit is, is exhausted at this juncture. So one hopes that it doesn't get to this point. I mean, you, you paint a very scary picture of the implication for the economy. Um, I mean, that the common man is already grinding under a lot of challenges. Yeah. Um, aside, we'll come back to the economy too, bit, but let's look at the environmental yeah. damage that this crisis mm. might include, because so much talk has been on the economic uh, uh, fallout, mm. but nobody seems to be emphasizing yeah. as much on the other mm. part of it. Absolutely. Now, I'm no environmental scientist, but I guess in researching the topic, I've had to delve into issues of environment. And the big worry is the degree of pollution that is caused by the excess number of vessels that are plying the, the Africa, Asia, Africa, Europe and Africa, America route. All right. I don't know the numbers specifically, but each ship emits a substantial amount of, of pollution that Africa then has to absorb. And we know that this pollution has wide-ranging effects on already fragile ecosystems and already fragile ways, ways of life. There are already concerns coming out of Somalia, for instance, that the excess amount of shipping that is plying Somali routes is having an impact on fishing in the country, which is a mainstay industry. And I imagine similar concerns will arise around South Africa, where fishing also plays a key role. So there is another negative externality that people aren't, are overlooking, rather, of environmental degradation, which in itself has a plethora of other externalities. Again, what this, this goes back to the fact that, you know, we have to try our utmost best to, to, to alleviate this, this crisis somehow, or at least to, to downscale the situation and try to normalize uh, trade through the Red Sea once again. But that's going to take a, a, very, a very substantial diplomatic effort. Mm. Political will is not one of our strong suits here in Africa, but there is still hope because we have people like you speaking up and talking about what needs to be done. Um, there is also talk about the coverage in the media about this crisis mm -hmm. um, um, and its uh, implication, the focusing. The, I, I saw a video, most of the videos I've seen is the amplification of the uh, gains for Africa. So I want you to look mm -hmm. at it. Um, do you agree that the current, mm -hmm. uh, the current media and political treatment of the crisis in Africa might not be taken in the whole picture? Yeah, um, I, I think I wouldn't just place that on, on the feet of, of the media and African media in general. I think the general analysis of this crisis has been quite narrow. Um, and I mean, that's the case with a lot of crises around the world. And that might point to um, exhaustion on, uh, on, on consumers and producers of medias. But yes, I would say that the coverage of, of the crisis has not been particularly thorough. And what is worrying is the extent to which people are oblivious of the effects of the crisis on their day-to-day -day lives, all right? Inflation is a concern. It hasn't subsided. We still haven't gotten past the COVID and the Ukraine-induced spike. To have another one will have a devastating impact on people's uh, welfare. You guys in Nigeria are already having grumblings over welfare concerns and uh, threats uh, of of uh, of, of uh, public unrest or public gatherings, similar sentiment is being conveyed by by uh, by by political actors and the general public in a number of African countries. All right, so this crisis poses a multifaceted risk on Africa, and I think that is something that is not particularly captured in the media, and also not reflected quite well by our our politicians as well dare i say okay let's go back to the economics of it because that's where everybody's interesting mm. to lie and talk about 
Egypt's very uh, seemingly intricate position on this crisis. Mm. Um, an estimated 15% of global trade, what around $1 trillion, uh, goes through the Red Sea mm. from what I've seen um, and passing through Egypt's Suez Canal, the country's mm. national um, income. What is your yeah. thinking about Egypt's uh, position on this yeah. crisis? Yeah, look, I mean, Egypt is one of the, the, the most vulnerable states, if not the most vulnerable state. All right. They are losing millions, hundreds of millions of dollars per month as a result of the diversion. The finance minister came out at the end of January, I believe, and, no and noted that Egypt had lost around $400 million dollars of revenue alone all right or trade facilitation fees this is discounting all the other smaller supply chain activity that goes on around the Suez canal all right so egypt is making a substantial loss from this crisis and what is particularly pressing for egypt is that they are they are enduring a a crisis and a crisis of sorts all right independent of what's going on in the Suez canal egypt has a substantial amount of debt to repay. They also have a foreign exchange crisis, right? They've got very limited fiscal buffers. So to have another strain on their revenue inflows only exacerbates or worsens their position. So this is a crisis that Egypt can ill afford. And I guess that's why you find Egypt leading the discussion, trying to facilitate discourse between the Houthis, Iran, and the West to try and garner some kind of de-escalations because they know that if this goes on, you, it, it, it effectively neutralizes a key revenue generator for an already fragile Egyptian economy. Uh, before we uh, extend it to the rest of Africa and how the common man will mm. feel it, I, I want to ask you mm. to uh, talk about the options, aside from mediating talks, how would Egypt, mm. if, if this crisis, for instance, um, goes on for maybe another three months, what do you foresee as the fallout for Egypt and its economy? Yeah, so with, with Egypt, the big concern here is the revenue loss and uh, the undermining of, or the, rather the weakening of its fiscal position. All right, Egypt already operates a relatively high deficit, you take away the revenue from the Suez Canal, which is about $7 billion. Sometimes on a good year, it goes up to $10 billion a year. That is a substantial portion of Egypt's revenue. The second concern is foreign exchange. Egypt is currently battling a foreign exchange shortage due to elevated imports, which they had to pay because of the weakening of the pound and also an increase in the price of their imports induced by the crisis in Ukraine. Hence why they've appealed to the IMF. Now, this appeal to the IMF was started before this whole crisis. So, so Egypt finds itself in a, in a very precarious position. But again, you undermine revenue from the Suez Canal, you undermine Egypt's internal position and external position, and you place the country in a vulnerable situation where they're at an elevated risk of defaulting on very substantial debt obligations that they faced this year. So Egypt, Egypt is in trouble. What, what, what other country do you think will uh, face a similar impact from this crisis aside Egypt? Uh, we've talked about the countries mm. that may gain, but what about other countries? Yeah. So, so to generalize, I would say that countries that have a Red Sea-facing maritime industry are going to be hard hit, all right? And depending on how large that industry is, the impact will be larger, all right? So after Egypt, and perhaps even more than Egypt, Djibouti. Djibouti garners more than half of its GDP from trade that is undertaken in, uh, in the Red Sea. And more pressing for Djibouti is the fact that its major port, the port of Dola, Dorale, and, and other port facilities are located along the Bab el Mandeb Strait, all right, which is the corner between Yemen and the Horn of Africa, all right, that, that small pathway there. 
and most of the attacks have been concentrated in and around that area. So the crisis threatens to effectively cripple the entirety of Djibouti's economy. Now, unlike Egypt, Djibouti doesn't have much diplomatic clout. It doesn't have a navy. It doesn't have, or it does have a navy, but it, it doesn't have the, the capacity to intervene or to at least mount substantial defense. All it can do is depend on uh, on the military bases, the foreign military bases in the country, and hope that perhaps they can deter and deflect some of the tensions. But Djibouti is in big trouble, perhaps even bigger than Egypt. After that, I'd say Sudan, all right? And uh, I'd say Eritrea as well. In as much as the country doesn't engage in much trade, it still is a, a vital component of the economy, right? And with flows from the Red Sea compromised, so is Eritrea's earnings from trade, so is, um, is Sudan's earnings. And then Ethiopia. Ethiopia, which conducts most of its, th its trade through Djibouti. And like Djibouti, it doesn't have assets on the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean to be able to protect vessels that are strategic to it, right? As you well know, Egypt, uh, Ethiopia rather, is landlocked. So it's completely dependent on the dynamics of the countries through which it undertakes that trade. And okay. there is a real risk that trade into and out of Ethiopia via the Red Sea can come to a bottleneck if this crisis does not ease. So there, there doesn't seem to be any, a, I mean, from our conversation, there doesn't seem to be um, any real gains for Africa in this crisis. If we take, want to break it down um, for how it will impact mm. the common man, you talked earlier about the increased cost of shipping. An increase in mm. global oil prices due to the increased mm. shipping cost will definitely affect many African uh, countries, especially those, like you've highlighted, who rely on imported petroleum. But how would this manifest for the common man? I mean, we've been talking about the high indices, but how would the common man feel the impact of these things? So that's, that's a very good question. I think it's always important to, to distill it for the common man. So higher oil prices mean higher prices for refined petroleum, things like, like, uh, like diesel for instance, things like unleaded 94 that you buy, things like paraffin, all right? That means transport providers will have to pay more to fill up their taxis. And what do they do when they have to pay more to fill up their taxis? They charge you, the commuter, a higher fare. So you're going to have to pay more money to get to work relative to August last year before the crisis. That's one impact on the common man. The same thing happens with retailers, all right? They're going to have to pay their logistical providers, or if they do the logistics internally, they're going to have to pay more to ferry goods from the warehouses to the stores, all right? What do they do when they have to pay more in that respect? They shift the burden onto consumers. So don't be surprised in a few months' time and you want to make, uh, we call it pop over here, I think you guys call it fufu, and you have to, you want to buy maize meal, and it's suddenly risen in prices, all right? That's because of a transmission from higher shipping costs, all right, to higher logistical costs, to higher market prices that consumers then have to pay. So that is, that is the inflationary route. And what is particularly concerning, all right, with things like fuel, is that it affects everything. Everything that needs to be transported, all right, will be affected by higher fuel prices, right? So you're talking, I mean, people need to be transported, so your transport costs will be higher. Food needs to be transported. Clothes needs to be transported, all right? So there is, I would say, a compound inflationary risks, or risk rather, that stems from the crisis. Then you also have the interest rate effect, I don't know if you want to get into that as well. But, we are, uh, we're almost out of time. A... We're almost out of time ah, for this right. uh, segment of the uh, program. But I, I'd like you to speak on responses from African leaders, particularly the African mm. Union. What has been your response mm. to this crisis? What are they saying? And in your view, what should they be saying about the crisis? 
Yeah, um, to be fair, the response has been quite muted. The one country that has been particularly vocal, but it hasn't spoken about the crisis directly, is South Africa, as you well know. And South Africa is effectively taking the route of Egypt in saying that if you if you find some kind of conciliation between Palestine and 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 Israel, you basically reduce the motivating factor for the Houthi attacks. So solve Israel, Palestine, and therefore you can solve the destabilization by the Houthis and therefore the Red Sea crisis. And we're seeing murmurs to that effect mostly coming out of, of South Africa. What is concerning, though, is that this conflict does risk decoupling from Israel, Palestine and becoming a proxy war in and of itself. We haven't gotten to that stage yet, but it does remain, I'd say it's more of a tail risk. But um, African countries have mostly doubled down on seeking peace in, uh, in Israel, Palestine as a mechanism for de-escalating the crisis, which I think, I mean, given our positionality and given the discourse around the crisis and the conflict is, is fairly prudent. But more important thing, all right, is to ensure preparedness for any economic eventuality, all right, irrespective of how it arises. And I think that's where most of our, our leaders are falling short, all right? Our fiscal buffers are thin, our monetary buffers are thin, our economies are underperforming, our infrastructure is is not fit to capture the opportunities that are arising from crises okay. like the Red Sea crisis. Okay. Like okay. The talking, crisis, talking about, uh, we're we almost out of time, Menzi. Uh, talking about um, mm. uh, capturing the infrastructure that we need, I want you to, there's an old mm. adage that uh, never let a crisis go to waste. So I want you to speak in, you, you, you talked a bit about it when we started about the policies that needs that uh, Africans are waking up to, but how can Africa benefit from this crisis in the long term? Infrastructure is one of them, isn't it? Key. We don't have enough and well-capacitated ports on the continent. South Africa, Egypt, Nigeria to a slight extent, and Kenya do have them, but they're not enough on the continent. So we can start there. The second thing, human capital, all right? We don't have adequate human capital to be able to be maximally productive in logistics. And it's not particularly complicated to develop this human capital through education. That is another, um, another apple that we can potentially look to 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 price all right the the next one i'd say is regulation we need to simplify the regulation around doing trade through african ports and within africa itself which is a conversation in and of itself all right there's too much red tape on this continent when it comes to doing business which ultimately undermines our earnings we can definitely simplify that there are also issues around security that I know you folks up in the Gulf of Guinea are dealing with that need to be resolved, that also pose um, a, 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 a deterrent to potential uh, maritime activity. So that's, that's another one that needs to be resolved. And where we lack the capacity, there's no shame in partnering with companies and countries that have greater expertise in order to build capacity and infrastructure. And this is where, where territories like Somaliland and countries like uh, like Djibouti um, and, and countries like Namibia and Mozambique are getting it right. They're saying we might not have this capacity, but DP World has the know-how. So come teach us how to do it for and we a can decade grow. or so uh, and help us build this capacity. I particularly like your submission on the there is no shame in getting the help <laughs> that we need in order to grow. I'd love to talk more with you, Menzi. You make this conversation very engaging. So thank you very much for speaking with us. And I look forward to having you on the show you. another time. Absolutely. Keep well and farewell to you and your viewers. Thank you. We're still here. So um, something he said about what Africa needs to do, uh, ports development for us to 
get some gain from this uh, Red Sea and the crisis, and then human capital development. So I'm going to focus on human capital development because when we come back from this break, we'll be looking at the offshoot of the 37th AU Summit, talking about addressing education challenges in Africa. The strategy that was um, 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 uh, put up has it been implemented? To what extent? And what do we need to do to improve on it? That's after the break. Do stay with us.